Hello everyone, my name is Nate Ferguson and this is Yeast Basics 2, Lecture 2 of Module 1. So today, the problem we are trying to solve is as such. This is a follow-up to our Lecture 1 where we talked about how a lot of brewers don't fully understand how yeast aeration works. They don't understand why a yeast cell requires oxygen. So last, last lecture we covered that, why the yeast cell needs oxygen, what benefits it causes, what, why we should be doing this for our yeast cells. Today, we're going to be focusing on how you actually achieve this. Now, when we see a lot of brewers, a lot of brewers will think their aeration game is on point. They know exactly what they're doing. A lot of brewers think they aerate effectively. They hook up their stone, oxygen goes in, they think it's working, but they have no way to actually determine or, or validate whether or not it's actually aerating as they see fit. In our experience, a lot of breweries don't fully understand what they're doing, how, sorry, whether or not what they're doing works. A lot of brewers think they're aerating but they're not. So today we're going to talk about the mechanics and explain the mechanics of how you aerate, how to determine whether or not you have proper aeration, and we'll go through some tools, techniques, and methods that will help you amplify the amount of aeration that you have inside of your wort before your yeast gets to it. Now the TLDR for today's lecture, too long, didn't read. Uh, long transfer lines are, provide more time and more contact time for the O2 to enter solution. It's one of the biggest things we see breweries do. Short lines are bad when you're trying to cast your wort out. You don't want them. Longer transfer lines provide more contact time and duration for that oxygen to get inside a solution, which means it's not going to flash off your tank. The flow rate of the gas is more important than pressure. We'll talk about this a lot, but there's a, you know, a lot of brewers just use a PSI gauge to figure out how much they're aerating. This is not a great method. Now, the key principle when it comes to all this, you know, this conversation as to how we get oxygen inside of our wort, a key concept of turbulence is going to keep on coming up. Turbulence is the main mechan mechanism for wort aeration. Sintered stones create some turbulence by creating very, high, very small high pressure bubbles with a high surface area. And agitators such as static diffusers, dual jets, things like that will also add large amounts of turbulence. And finally, air injector systems require maintenance. If an issue suddenly appears, check your O2 system a handful of times. That's the case here. Something's built up, something stopped working. That's where the problem arises. So we're going to break today down into kind of two large chunks. The first one we're going to go is this, the theory of, uh, of how turbulence and gas liquid mixing occurs. We're then going to go into Henry's Law and talk about gas solubility. A bunch of you have probably already heard about Henry's Law when it comes to yeast brinks and things. Sorry, not yeast brinks. Uh, carbonation and bright tanks. We'll talk about that a little bit. We're then going to move into some different examples as to how we actually get this stuff inside of our, our wort. We'll talk about sintered stones, static mixers, duo jets, and ventrally, tu ventrally turbulence uh, driven devices, and finally centrifugal mixing. So now the standard disclaimer for all, all these lectures, the goal of this series is to educate and advise you on the application of yeast in the brewery so you can avoid common problems. I will be sometimes making some you know, making things oversimplified so that everyone can understand it a bit more simply. If you do want us to go into further detail on a, on a certain topic, I expect there to be a few for today. Please leave a comment in the section, sorry, and please leave a comment in the comment section down below and we will answer it doing, during one of our Q and A's. One additional disclaimer for today. Today's topic is multivariable. I mean, there's multiple different things that are going on and all these different elements will feed back and influence each other. I'm going to be presenting the information today, what I think is easiest, easiest for you to take away with and apply first. The things that are more difficult, more complicated, more expensive, we'll be talking about later on in today's lecture. Uh, the things we'll be talking about first are going to be the easiest things for you to take and walk away with. Now, this doesn't mean these things at the very end aren't important or are a pipe dream. A lot of these different elements and principles can be easily incorporated inside of your brewery. They're just less common. Now, first off, Get to section one, turbulence and gas liquid mixing. We have to talk about types of flow. Turbulence is the property of a flowing liquid in a tube to bounce, redirect, and churn on itself. You can see this in the image on the right-hand side on the bottom. In turbulent flow systems, the liquid is constantly collapsing back on itself, folding back on, folding on, over itself. In most systems, this isn't what we want. It's not what we want at all. This is actually a huge waste of energy, especially if we're just trying to move large bulk volumes from one place to the other. However, this churning and mixing up provides a great ability for anything that's in this tube to become homogenized. Anything that, say, I have a colloidal solution of two different components, if I have a high turbulent flow, I will get a rather homogenous liquid or uniform liquid on the other side. Same thing goes when we're looking with wort and air. If I have a mixture of wort and air going through this tube and I have laminar flow, those layers are more likely to separate. If I have turbulent flow, those, liquid, those layers are more likely to fold back on each other, mix, and become a nice, uniform, cohesive blend. Or for our cases, your wort will be aerated. 
Now, laminar flow is the property of a liquid to flow cleanly and evenly throughout a tube, which we see here now on the bottom right. Laminar flow is simple, it's smooth, but as I said previously, if we're using this for beer, the two phases will likely separate. I've seen one brewery where if they're casting out their wort and they had air bubble, an air phase on the top of the, of the tube and a liquid phase on the bottom. This isn't useful. Your wort is not being aerated. Your wort just has a little gas bubble sitting on top of it as it goes through the tube. Now, turbulence is the main mechanism for mixing gases inside of liquids. You're gonna hear turbulence a lot today because turbulence is how large amounts of these things occur. A lot of what we'll talk about today is how, ways in which we can induce turbulence in our, in our pipes that we can actually get our wort to become aerated or induce wort aeration. So, good place to start is how can we induce more turbulence? How can we make our flow more turbulent? Now the two main mechanisms we have, or two main levers we have to pull, are fluid velocity, or the flow rate, liters per second, and the hose diameter. Now you've all probably seen examples of this in the past, or just in your, in your own houses. Uh, if you look at a tap for fluid velocity, if I have a little bit of liquid coming through, if the tap's open just a little bit, I'm probably going to get a nice, clean, consistent, uniform flow of water coming out. However, if I open that hose all the way, the spray will no longer be in a nice uniform stream. It will spray, it will, sh it will scatter, it's going to hit a larger surface area. This is a great example of turbulence. We increase the flow rate, we increase the amount of turbulence. That liquid is folding back on itself and spraying in different directions. Now we can also look at hose diameter. We'll use a garden hose example for this. If I have a garden hose flowing with a, st a sta stable amount of liquid coming through, and I have just it open at the very end, it's, I'm going to have a nice, uniform, clean stream of liquid coming out. But if I put my finger on that and I reduce the diameter, the flow is the same, but it's now going to be spraying in all sorts of different directions. I have reduced the diameter, therefore I'm going to in be inducing turbulence. If you want to look more into these things, you can go into Reynolds numbers. It's well outside the scope of what we're covering today, but if you want to look into it, that's where you, go, you can go. So, how can we apply these two different elements inside the brewery? How can we, how can we alter these two different properties? How can we in increase turbulence? Not as easy as we'd want. Now, if we look at the flow rate for casting out inside of most breweries, this is typically set. This isn't really a thing we can usually influence that much. Some breweries can, if you have a CLT, a cold liquor tank or something like that, you can alter this. But a lot of breweries, you're just using groundwater. Usually for breweries, cooling water is fully open, like you're, you're using the max amount of cooling water that's possible. And then you're choking or slowing down with a VFD or something like that, the pump that pushes the wort out of the brew house. This means that your flow rate out of the brew house is consistent. You can't really alter it. This, you can alter it seasonally. In the summer, your, wort, your flow rates might decrease because your groundwater warms up. A slower flow rate will equal less turbulent flow, which will unfortunately equal less gas mixing. In the winter, wort flow rates are faster the ground because the groundwater is colder. This can cause a faster flow rate going through the heat exchanger, which will in induce more turbulent flow, more gas mixing. We can't really do much about this unless we have a cold liquor tank or things like that. So we're going to move on to the next, next, next method, or next thing we can potentially alter. Hose diameter. Now, unfortunately, this is also not one that most breweries can influence. Now, if you find yourself looking to re, uh, looking to re up or you know replace your current uh, hoses that are used to transfer wort out of your brew house, you may want to keep this in mind. But most breweries don't have much say what hose they're, they're working with. Most hoses are scaled to the equipment. If the bottom TC port on the on your brew house is 1.5 inches, there's a very good chance that your hose is 1.5 inches. That's usually how this goes. If we were to, however, have a smaller hose, a smaller ID hose, inner diameter, we would see some additional turbulence inside of that hose. Just something to keep in mind when, when, you, when you're looking to replace your hosing. Now, with that, we're going to go on to see the next thing we could potentially alter, which is look at Henry's Law and see if there's anything with Henry's Law, which governs gas solubility. Can we alter that? So Henry's Law states that the partial pressure of the gas above a liquid is directly proportional to the amount of that gas dissolved in the liquid. Might be a little bit more, com might be a little complex. Uh, we're gonna get, we're gonna try and simplify this for everyone right here. Now in brewing, we normally talk about Henry's law when it comes to carbon dioxide car for carboning bright tanks, but the same principle applies for oxygen. So let's get a little physical example here. So here we have the same container with the gas on top and liquid on the bottom. So in the left hand side, we are currently in equilibrium. Everything's nice and stable. In the middle, what they've done is they've applied pressure. They've pushed down. 
on that gaseous phase. And what they end up seeing when we do this is that more, part more gas particles start becoming dissolved inside of the liquid. We have increased the partial pressure, therefore we will increase the, the amount of that gas that will go inside the liquid. Now this takes some time to stabilize. It does not happen instantly, which you can see right here. In the middle, the pressure is applied, and we do not see the gas like that go inside the solution. It requires some time. Now all gases do this, all of them. They will eventually all re reach a dynamic equilibrium. When it comes to trying to figure out, or trying to, trying to accelerate this reaction, there are a few things we can work with. And those two main things we can work with are contact time and surface area. So we're gonna dive into those two now. So contact time. This is by far the easiest thing that you as a brewer can influence, by far. It's also one of the places where we see brewers have the most amount of trouble. So we're gonna go into it. This is the time the bubbles the, from our, our, our O2 stone, wherever it may be, are in contact with the liquid. The longer the time that ga this, this interaction occurs, the more completely dissolved the gas will be. And we can influence this very easily. It's simple. You can increase your Holmes runs. We're gonna, and we're gonna show why that occurs in a few slides. Now the second thing we can do is the surface area. The larger the surface area, the more area there is for this reaction to occur. This is why sintered stones and different devices like this are so important. Smaller bubbles have a, a far greater surface area than larger bubbles per, per gas molecule. This is, the smaller the bubble, the faster diffusion is going to occur. Now a side note for this, smaller bubbles also have a higher pressure inside of them. That's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. We can just take that as, as, uh, as known. This means that because we have a higher pressure in the bubbles, Henry's law states that the higher the partial pressure the, uh, inside the gas, the, fat, the more is going to go inside the liquid. Higher pressure in the, in the bubble, more is going to go inside the liquid. Best of both worlds. We'll talk about aeration stones in a few slides. Now, this is we're, we're gonna start off when it comes to contact time in a worst case scenario. Now, we've seen a few clients uh, aerate their wart at the tank. They don't aerate their wart coming out of the brew house. Um, they aerate their wart right at the, at the fermenter. This is not a great idea. This is not recommended, mainly because we're minimizing that contact time present for air mixing. So we'll go through an example for this. Air is added to the bottom of the tank. The air is then going to travel all the way through the tank. Not all of that air is going to have dissolved inside a solution. In most cases for th tanks like this, unless we're talking about tanks that are several stories tall, most of it's probably going to flash off. This means that your wort is not properly aerated. This is where brewers often get confused. Air was applied to the tank, but it, did, but it did not dissolve. The beer did not ferment well, even though I aerated it. This is one of the largest sources for confusion that we see when it comes to a lot of brewers. This is part of the reason why we do not recommend hooking up oxygen to the bottom of your fermenter as, as the primary source for aeration. It doesn't work very well. Now we do see this similar thing happen though when we start working with, uh, with brewers, especially brewers that have grown and have tanks you know, in different proximities to the brew house. So we have seen breweries, and this is a very common occurrence, when breweries use short hoses between their fermenters and the heat exchanger and their wort, wort aeration system. Much like aerating the, the wort at the bottom of your fermenter, the, wort, the, the, sorry, the oxygen does not have a large amount of time to actually have contact with the wort. It does not have enough time nor enough turbulence to induce mixing for this wort, sorry, for this oxygen go inside of the wort. We have had, we had one client where uh, there was about a three foot span between the, their heat exchanger and, their, and the, one of their fermenters. And that fermenter always had problems. This is why. The air was applied, but it was not, not given enough time, contact or turbulence to go inside a solution. So to kind of give you guys just a larger breakdown of this, and this is something that we've seen many clients have problems with. So here is a brew house on the right-hand side. We have three different fermenters, one that is five feet away, one that's 25 feet away, and one that is 50 feet away. Now, if we want to frame this with contact time in mind, we've, and I just want to emphasize this, we've seen this, I see, saw this three times this past week. Let's give you an idea of how prevalent this is. If you look at the contact time, the five foot hose is not going to give us enough, enough the oxygen enough time to dissolve inside that wart. Most of that, that oxygen is going to go inside that wart and then flash off into that tank. Now, if we go to the 25 foot hose, 
that is far more time, far more contact time for that gas to become dissolved and go inside a solution. We're going to give, a, if, if we have turbulent flow inside that hose, we're giving it much more turbulence, much more time in turbulence for that gas to go inside a solution. And the 50 foot hose, well, I, most of that gas is probably going inside a solution. We have given it far more surface area, far more contact time, especially to, than that five foot hose in order for the, that gas to go inside a solution. We've done some, uh, some work with some, some clients on this and almost you know, like, kind of like this diagram here where you have a heat map. The tanks closest to the brew house typically have the most problems. The tanks furthest from away from the brew house typically have the least amount of problems. This is usually, or we believe this to be mainly derived from DO content. You need to give your, you need to give your, your, uh, your wort enough time to have contact with that, uh, that oxygen. Just because you applied oxygen doesn't mean it actually went inside a solution. The solution here is really simple. Regardless of how far away your tank is, use the same hose. Use the longest hose you got. If, you, if for that tank that's five feet away, use your 50 foot hose. It might seem ridiculous, but it's going to ensure that you have proper contact time for that gas to go inside a solution. So to put it all together, you know, contact time for that gas in, with your wart is absolutely paramount. And the easiest way to ensure that you have consistency within your entire facility is to use the same long hose for every tank, regardless how far away it is. It sounds silly, it sounds ridiculous, but it's going to facilitate the contact time required for that gas to go inside solution. Focusing on contact time with your wart and oxygen is a much better framing than how long you put or how long you applied oxygen to it. You can apply oxygen to a tank and none of it can go inside a solution. Contact time assures it efficiently goes inside solution. So a few little questions to wrap up. Um, something else you can do just to, uh, to increase aeration as well, and I, I want to put an asterisk on this, you need to reach out to your tank manufacturer first because not all tanks are rated for it. We're microbiologists, we are not stainless steel manufacturers. Please reach out to your, to your tank manufacturer on this. But we have a handful of clients that will add spunding valves or restrict the, 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 uh, the outfeed of, the, of their tanks. Something so, in the area so that their tank's able to handle four to 10 PSI. What we're doing here is we're increasing back pressure. We're applying a partial pressure on the oxygen to go inside a solution. This is Henry's law. This is the same thing we use for carbonation. We're applying more partial pressure of oxygen so we can get more oxygen to go inside a solution. This is very similar to how we treat a bright tank. This works very effectively. I just wanna stress, talk to your manufacturer before you attempt something like this because your tank may not be rated for it. As long as you do that, you're good. So with that, we're now going to get into some of the mechanics. So sintered stones. Now, I'm sure we've all seen these before. We, see, we have these in our bright tanks. We have these in, even in homebrew kegs. We see these everywhere. Sintered stones are used to create many, many small bubbles, as you see here on the right-hand side. And they have a higher PSI. We know that we already talked about this. Higher PSI from Henry's Law means we're going to have more solubility. Additionally, all these super tiny little bubbles have a much higher surface area to volume ratio. That contact time fr fraction is how, now higher. Which this will all allow the geese bubbles to dissolve much more rapidly. Now every stone, it's important to note this, is going to provide what we call a wetting pressure or back pressure, which must be overcome in order for flow to occur. This is something that we have seen many clients have problems with where they don't take this account properly. So we're going to take a few slides here and go through how this wetting pressure is applied, how we overcome it, and how you can troubleshoot to make sure that you're actually overcoming it as you think. But before we do that, we have to talk about the other devices, the, the, the meters we're currently working with. Now, the first one you're going to have is a PSI gauge. A PSI gauge tells us how much pressure we are expelling from the tank. Very important. This is often, however, where brewers stop. And I would argue they're missing the most important piece of equipment when it comes to wort aeration. And that's a flow meter. Now, a flow meter is just going to measure how many, how many liters per minute of oxygen or whatever the gases that we're working with are being injected inside the liquid. Now this will go upstream of the sintered stone, so I can know I say I have 30 PSI at 10 liters per minute. Having both of these pieces of information is important. And I would argue that if you don't have a flow meter, you're kind of flying blind. Let me explain. So let's go through an example here. This is just a sintered stone inside a tube, much like what you use for casting out. But we don't have the wart coming online yet. We don't have wart flowing through yet. In order for us to have flow, we must overcome that wetting pressure of the stone. So let's assume, you know, no beer flow, and let's assume we have 10 PSI of wetting pressure. Side note, 10 PSI is pretty high. I'm using 10 because it's a nice, easy round number. So let's look at how the system would look like. 
Now we have 20 PSI going in. Since we have 10 PSI of wetting pressure, I'm going to have roughly 10 PSI of gas inside this area right outside the tube. Pretty simple. 20 minus 10 equals 10. We have no idea in this situation what the flow rate is. We don't know if that 10 PSI is going to take us a second or two to stabilize out or whether or not it is going to take us a day. This is where things can start going, getting, going wrong. So now let's add the beer. Let's say we're in a normal situation where we have beer and O2 flowing. How do we know how much O2 is flowing in? We know we have 20 PSI on the reg. We know we have wort coming through. In this situation, we actually don't know how much flow is going through if we don't have a flow meter. Now the solution here is dead simple. We add a flow meter. Now we can have one liter per minute or 10 liters per minute under the situation. With a flow meter, we can dial that in. But without having the flow meter, we're kind of just flying blind. We're, we're hoping that oxygen is coming, is coming in. Now, in my opinion, and this is somewhat controversial, I want to state this is my opinion, um, a flow meter is more important than a PSI gauge. Knowing you have 10 liters of uh, per minute of flow is much more useful than knowing you have 10 PSI. The reason for this is that that 10 PSI doesn't necessarily mean we have flow. I'll give you an example. In this scenario, we have 10 PSI of beer flowing, be, sorry, being applied to our stone. 20 PSI of O2 is being applied, and we have a back pressure of 10 PSI. In situations like this, we have 20 PSI on the reg, we can actually not have flow because the 10 PSI that's, that's be, we have 10 PSI of the wart is pushing against the sintered stone, which means that 20 minus 10 from, from the wetting pressure minus 10 from the wart equals zero and no flow. We've had a handful of clients find themselves in the situation where they think they're aerating their wart heavily and they're not. You know, they, they, they don't have any, they actually don't have any flow. They're only working with a PSI gauge on this. This is not good. Simple answer is get a flow meter. Please, please get a flow meter. Now, here's an even more common problem we, we encounter. Uh, the sintered stone has not been cleaned in a while or more commonly, the cleaning performed of the stone has not been effective. I've had a few clients like, oh yeah, every single time I use it, I put the stone inside a caustic every, and you know, it's always, if it's not being in use, it's inside a caustic. That doesn't mean it's being cleaned effectively. So let's say this, our initial wetting pressure was 10 PSI, but because it's now dirty, it has partic par uh, particles inside of it, it's now 15 PSI. If I have 10 PSI of wort coming through, or even five PSI as you see here, I'm not gonna have O2 O2 flow. In this situation, you're doing the exact same thing. The brewer hasn't stopped doing what they were doing before, and before it worked, now it's not. And this is where we start seeing brewers have problems. Again, a solution here, get a flow meter. If you know you have 20 PSI and you see the flow is, deep, is lower, you know you have to amp the PSI up in order to neutralize, in order to, to get your flow rate back up. And this is probably an indicator that you now need to clean your, your uh, sintered stone a bit more effectively. We see this all the time. This is, not, this is not one brewery, this is not two breweries, this is a lot of breweries. Now, what if you can't get a flow meter? I disagree. You can get them for 15 bucks on Amazon. You may not want to buy from Amazon. My point here is they're fairly cheap. But let's say it's true. Let's say you can't get a flow meter. This is why we have sight glasses. This is why we can see our cast out lines. Now it's not as good, but it's absolutely better than nothing. One thing I want to sit on here and point out. What you see here is just a normal wart line. Oxygen's not being applied. What you want to see is mixing. You want to see it folding back on itself. You want to see turbulence. We've, I've seen a handful of breweries where they're casting out and they have oxygen on top and they have their wort underneath, moving in laminar fashion, not mixing. This is an indication that you're applying oxygen to that tank, but it's not actually going inside a solution. Just keep an eye on it. Keep an eye for, out for that. Now, a way we can solve this, and this is, we're going to go to the next element, is a, what was called a static mixer. Now, a static mixer is a precision engineered device for continuous mixing of fluid materials without moving components. Now, I want to emphasize this. This doesn't move. None of these, move, none of these components swirl or you know, churn or anything like that. Everything is stable. The only thing that's mixing or moving around is the liquid. Now, I've been doing a lot of research and, and reading of old kind of German textbooks and things that the English translations. And this piece of technology seems to be very, very common in these older textbooks and more of these German translated textbooks. But for North American brewing, I've only found one reference for it. Uh, to, to, if anyone's curious the references I'm, working, I'm talking about are uh, Bolton and Quain, 
uh, brewing yeast and fermentation. They mentioned this once, uh, but Kunz, uh, brewing, sorry, malting and brewing house technology, I believe it is. He mentioned these quite quite heavily. Um, I've talked to a few different Weinstefan trained brewers, and yeah, these are standard. This seems to be a thing that the, the Germans have fixed for us, but North American brewers have not incorporated. So we're going to talk about it. Now these devices are used after a centered stone, and they produce large amounts of mixing or turbulence. You notice all these different baffles. These force, force the liquid around tight turns and force it back on each other itself to induce this mixing. Now in our case, we're trying to work talk about wort aeration, they will quickly induce turbulence and in increasing the rate of oxygen that's going inside a solution. They increase far more mixing than would ever naturally occur inside of a pipe. Now they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. This is a very large one. But in principle, they work like this. So we have two, in this case, we have two different streams. As with every single baffle and every single split, we see the two different streams forced spun on themselves and then peeled back over. Every single peel, every single spin is going to cause large amounts of turbulence, which will then induce the mixing we desire. Now, the nice thing about these devices is that whether or not you're working with turbulent or laminar flow, it doesn't matter. They will work in both cases. Whether or not you're working with turbulent flow or laminar flow, these will both induce high amounts of turbulence, which will rapidly increase the rate of mixing, which is exactly what we want for our wort aeration. Exactly what we want. Additionally, the amount of turbulence you're going to see in these small tubes is far more than what you'd see over a long run of pipe. So if you are finding yourself with aeration issues or you don't have a large enough hose or anything like that, this might be something you can add into your system. So yeah, static mixtures will also compound anything you have previously. If you have centered stone with very fine bubbles, a static mixer will, will allow that gas to go in solution much faster, just like what you see on the, bot on the bottom right. If you, even if you have medium-sized bubbles, even if you have that laminar chunk of gas floating on top of your wart, a static mixer will cause these two phases to mix and fold and churn on top of each other, rapidly increasing the rate at which these two substances become homo uh, homogeneous. Same goes for flow rate. Low flow rate, high flow rate, it's going to work. That's, one, that's the beauty of these devices. Now there's many different types of these. Uh, they're not the, the ones I showed previously are the most common. You have some Venturi tubes type one type ones you see on the top left. These are very similar to a uh, fuel injection system, uh, where we have a constriction that occurs and then a large expansion. That expansion or the post that constriction causes a large amount of turbulence, which then causes gas mixing. You also have these systems right here in the bottom that you see for uh, for a lot of water systems, things that don't have a lot of tr uh, chunks in them where you have a, a constriction event that occurs here, two little uh, air, air jets, which then induce mixing. In some fining uh, applications for large-scale breweries and other food manufacturing, you'll actually see an active process of this, where some of the normal stream is pulled off, pumped, and then pushed through a, a small static mixer to essentially create a concentrate, which is then reintroduced into a larger static mixer. This two-stage uh, addition of substance makes it things are nice and homog homogenous and easier uh, to move. That's the most common one. A less common one, uh, but something that you see commonly incorporated into uh, off-the-shelf wart aeration system, systems is what's called a duo jet. Uh, this essentially is a system where you have a circular centered stone in this device here. This essentially incorporates a static mixer with a centered stone. Now because this is an entire tube of centered stone, it's thought that the, the gas goes inside the solution much more efficiently, much more evenly. We see this compressed, the partial pressure with Henry's laws is, is increased, therefore that we see a large amount of increase in saturation here, followed by a rapid expansion, which induces large amounts of turbulence on the, turbulence on the other side. This change in pipe diameter from a small or from a small diameter to a large diameter is what induces and is, is what the driving force is behind this device. These are very common in kind of higher end wart aeration units, but not commonly done inside of uh, smaller smaller craft operations. And finally, this is something that's you see a large that's done frequently inside of uh, food manufacturing, not for wart, but for or not for oxygen, but for different substances, is centrifugal mixing, which essentially is just pushing putting it in a pump. Uh, centrifugal mixing uses the shear force and the agitation occurred in a with a centrifugal pump to mix two substances together. So the two sub substreams come together, they're mixed, they're ejected off to the side, and then caused to go out. Now, I said a pump. This is very similar to a pump, but you cannot use this. You cannot use your standard brewery pump. It will not do the same thing. It will help, but it will not do the same thing. 
One problem, just as before you start trying to add pumps to the outfeed of your war aeration line, is that because we're dealing with oxygen in a gas, most pumps will cavitate. They will make terrible sounds and will damage the impeller. So I would not recommend that you go and jump in and do this right away. Pumping a gaseous substance is complicated. I would not recommend it. Talk to your, your equipment manufacturers and they can, they can probably get you one of these. And that's the, bu the bulk of it. Um, when it comes to figuring out how much oxygen your yeast cells need, it's frustrating like most things in life. It varies. Lager yeasts love oxygen. They love tons of oxygen. 10 ppm or more, they're going to be happy. Nipahs and hazies also usually like large amounts of oxygen. These are strains that are used to open fermentation. They're used to having lots of oxygen. Some are lower than others. For us, we see our foggy London ale require less oxygen than something like our Vermont. Uh, Kvikes, Vits, Visins, things like that. These are usually, they, they enjoy oxygen, 6 to 10 ppm. More is more and more typically gives them more flavor. It makes them more expressive. Things like Cali or clean ale yeasts, they're moderate. 6 to 10 ppm, you can go even lower, they'll tolerate it. You know, you're, not, you're not looking for a lot of expressive flavor. They're going to be clean. and that, that, This will help them pretty much. And Saisons, they, they're pretty low. You, don't, you, can, you can get away with not doing a lot of aeration, and they're going to be pretty, pretty okay. One of the other places, just to note here, that we see some brewers have problems with aeration is from this switch from Cali and clean ales to New England and hazies. They use Cali. They use, they, they've been using the, you know, our, our Cali ale, WP001, USO5, whatever it may be. Um, and they've been using it for a long time, and that's a low oxygen requiring strain. So whenever they made their West Coast IPAs or things like that, the oxygen they were providing in their, in their system was fine. But when they now need to use more oxygen, they need to make, they're trying to make a NEPA or something that's hazy, something that is using one of these new yeasts that we're trying to get, use to get flavor, and it requires more oxygen. The amount of oxygen you're using before doesn't cut it. And that's where we see a lot of brewers have problems. Yeast A requires very minimal and their current method it works. Yeast B requires higher, and their current method doesn't work. The brewer did the same thing, got different results. This is where some confusion and frustration comes to. It usually comes from your lack of aeration. So how do I know if I have enough oxygen? Um, unfortunately, without a DO meter, you're, you're kind of playing by ear. Um, there is no way to, to effectively determine what PPM of O2 you have inside of your beer without a DO meter. That being said, your yeast cells will, experience, will enjoy having more oxygen. We talked about this last lecture. More oxygen means more energy, means more nutrient reserves, it means more, means more fatty acids, means more sterols. All these things the yeast cells will be happy with. We'll see increased viability, we'll see increased everything, that all the good things that we're looking for. So I would almost want to frame the question a bit differently. How do I know if I have enough wort aeration or wort oxygen? I would try to focus on how you can add more. Adding more is only going to make your yeast cells happier. So how you can do this? Adding longer hoses. Instead of using, a say, your, your, your five-foot hose to cast out wort to your close fermenter, use the long 50-foot one. You're going to ensure you get more oxygen going inside that beer. Installing static mixers if you can. If you, if you really want to try and push them out of O2, grab one. We're going to be making a video in the near future actually testing out a few that we got. Uh, if you want to wait till that, go for it. Um, spunding of tanks as well. If you, you talk to your tank manufacturer, if you can apply some back pressure to increase the amount of O2, apply Henry's Law and treat your yeast, your uh, fermenter a little bit like a brink, sorry, a bright tank, that'll work. Um, if you have any of the issues that we covered in, in lecture number one, where it's, you know, under attenuation, improper flavor compound production, di di increased diacetyl, increased aldehydes, you probably are under aerating your wort. You probably are. In our experience, most brewers are under aerating their wort. So kind of put them all together. Oxygen is important. It's incredibly important. It's hi often highly overlooked and brewers often just sit on and be like, I've been doing the same thing for a long time, not realizing that different strains require different amounts, not require, re realizing that their system that they're working with might be actually different. You know, hose lengths and the small things that you think don't matter actually have an impact. Most breweries think they're airing appropriately as they're applying oxygen to the tank, but because you can't check it, you don't know. You're probably not adding enough. I would really strongly recommend, I can't say this enough, try to add more oxygen to your tank. Your yeast, your yeast cells are going to thank you. Now if you don't want to do any of this, you don't want to spend, you don't want to you know, worry about or look at your system for this, don't worry. You can throw money at this problem. There are companies that do sell full automatic wort aeration systems. They all rely on the principles that we talked about today. They all, they all utilize sintered stones, static diffusers, duo jet systems, ventruli tubes. This is how they ensure usually several rounds of this so that you can kind of make a concentrated DO and then inject that further in. This is how they operate. And if you can look at these systems and take the principles we talked about today, you can, you can kind of figure out how they work.
And one kind of a few of questions to wrap up. Um, can you over aerate? Can you add too much oxygen? Uh, yeah, you can. However, uh, we've only encountered one case of over aeration, and it was it's from our reading and from our experience, it's much more common in very very large tanks that have very large long, very long runs. Essentially, a perfect storm for war aeration. Huge contact time, huge pressure differentials. You know, large large tank height, large liquid heights. It's it really is a perfect storm. Um, if you find yourself in this situation, just as a solution, one of the best things you can do is switch away from O2 gas into compressed air. That, now that might sound a little backwards. Make sure it's sterile compressed air. You know, get if you're using an air compressor, make sure you get oil filters and de-wetting uh, uh, moisture removers and as some way to sterilize the air. Uh, but the benefit here is that those non-oxygen gases in the compressed air will actually act as an air elevator. So they'll help mix and churn the entire contents of the tank. This is what the big guys do. This is what your Molson Labatt Coors Budweiser's do. They use compressed air because it helps make everything inside the tank homogenous. Your yeast is evenly distributed. Your different warts, your different fills are going to be homogenous because of those different gases stripping through. It can make your life easier. And final question, what about homebrew aeration? Uh, the principles we covered today are going to be the same regardless of whether it's large-scale commercial or small-scale homebrew. Look forward to a post on homebrew aeration. This lecture was already long enough. I didn't want to add more to it. And with that, I uh, thanks for checking in. Thanks for listening to us. I hope you learned something, and happy brewing, everyone. Cheers.